Hi everyone, I'm Dana from Love Osya, and I'm here today with Karen Janine talking about her new book, When Souls Tear, which is the sequel to her book that came out last year, When Days Tilt. Hi Karen, thanks for coming. Hi Dana, thanks so much for having me. Oh, pleasure. So this is actually my first time doing an interview with an author about a sequel and I, I was really conscious when I was thinking about the interview of okay we can't yes. give too many spoilers away um so I thought I'd yes. start just with um asking you about what the book is, book is about without yeah without mm -hmm. too many spoilers okay okay yeah I've actually given this some thought myself because it is really tricky to do because bearing in mind that I have to refer to the first book which also people may not have read so try not to spoil either book I'll, I'll just go back a little bit so the world of the time catches it's a two book duology um obviously that's what a duology is um and it's set it follows 14 year old Ava in 1858 London and Ava is a reluctant watchmaker's apprentice and at this time London is the biggest city the world has ever seen it's fast furious brutal and the latest terror that's happening in the streets is that people are disappearing they've been taken out of the middle of their own lives and when they come back they're damaged their souls are torn and then one day Ava's world is turned upside down when she finds that the body in her mother's grave that she's been visiting all her life is not that of her mother. And she also encounters this strange parallel version of London called Dunlin. And so Ava has to figure out who her mother really is, who she is really is, and what they both have to do with both Dunlin and the disappearances that are happening on the streets of London. So that's when days tilt. And during that book, we discover that the snatching, the, the, the disappearances are actually snatchings, they're time snatchings. People are being snatched out of their living timeline and going into this void, which is a place that hangs between different realities and is a nowhere place. And it can drive you mad. The longer you're there, the worse you, you, you're damaged when you come back. And Ava has um, some capabilities that enable her to not uh, be immune to snatching, but also to destroy the snatchers. So she's been tasked in the second book in When Souls Tear, she's been tasked with destroying the time snatchers, which are in uh, both worlds, London and Dunlin. And so we start the book back in London in 1858. She's frustrated because she's looking after her father, who she loves dearly, but he's been snatched. So he's torn, he's badly torn, he's not well. Um, her ally, her supposed ally, who is this snarky, snobby girl called Phoebe, who is Ava's nemesis. Um, she, you know, she's a schoolmate um, at Mrs. Buss's School for Girls, not a mate, but she's been um, allocated as a Ava's ally in this job. Ava's not quite sure why, not, not very happy about it. But anyway, Phoebe is also snatched and dosed up to the eyeballs on laudanum. No good to anyone. And Jack, who is... It, Ava's close friend who she's befriended during Wednesday's tilt is back in Dunlin. He's also torn. So um, she's frustrated. She's not getting anywhere. She's no closer to getting the, rid of the time snatches. And then very unexpectedly, she encounters her sister, her half sister in London. And um, Jade, who says to Ava, come to Dunlin and I will help you destroy the time snatches. And so anyway, Ava ends up going to Dunlin ends up encountering these new characters, this extreme circus, which makes or breaks participants. She meets the seamstress and her needlies who can sew worlds together and mend them apart, uh, the malevolent black friars. And she ends up realizing that there's a much bigger threat than just merely time snatches that in, you know, affect individual people, but the whole of London and Dublin are at risk. And so she has to go into battle with some very unexpected allies. And I think I've explained it without spoiling it. <laughs> you did well. There's a lot of layers to this story. It's incredible. There's a lot going on. Yeah. yeah. Now, one of the things that I found really interesting, because I watched your interview when with our with Alex last year mm -hmm. um, when the, the first book was you talked about how that book first started out as rhyming couplets and then it was a contemporary mm. novel and then it became a historical fantasy um did you mm. always intend for there to be two books a duology or did that evolve no. as well nothing about this was planned okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll be perfectly frank with you. It was completely an evolving thing that I was rolling along with and finding out about as I went. Uh, you know, it's my first book and I um, learned a lot about the process of writing a novel and planning. So, no, in fact, it was actually... Um, there's actually more stories. This is was actually in my, when I got to the stage of realising it was historical fantasy and I had it plotted out into three books. Okay. And so those three books then came into two because we decided that worked better. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty multi-layered world. Um, and so, yeah, there are other stories that are shooting off to the side of the main action. So I'm, I've got those to deal with as well. But, um, yeah, I think it was just, I didn't plan it to be a series, but the story was just too big for one book and I had no choice but to let it spill out into to another story. Yeah, I see. Excellent. And so with that process, is that that's something that comes out, that came out through the editing process once you'd sort of gotten your contract with Penguin to go, well, oh, actually, no, it needs to be two books or no, it can't be 15 books because there's so many plot lines, things like that. Is yeah. that how it comes about? Well, when I first talked to Penguin, I thought it was going to be three books mm -hmm. and they suggested it should be two books. One from a commercial point of view, apparently it's much easier to sell a two book series, especially for a debut author. So they wanted it as two books and that was hard work for me because was, there was a lot to cram into two books. Um, but it was always a two book deal. That's, what, that's, the, book I, that's mm -hmm. the book deal I signed with Penguin was a two book deal. So you know, I've got more stories. I haven't actually got a contract for more stories. <laughs> so we'll see what happens because I have other, you know, stories competing for my attention as well. So, yeah, it was always two books and no more than two books. But having said that, there is another story which I've got planned out. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll see. We'll keep our eye out. Mm. Now, you'd also spoken about falling into these research rabbit holes when you were writing the mm. first book. And I wondered if that happened this as well with the second book, because I noticed I, I probably because I've been watching that interview, I was picking up things about like sewing and, and details of clothing and things like that, that I thought, oh, that's really interesting. And there's a lot of research that's gone mm. into this book as well. Did you find that as well? Yes, I suppose I researched for both books at the same time because it's the same world. So um, there were probably details in the second book um, about some blacksmithing. I actually consulted with a Melbourne blacksmith about that um, because he, you know, how they traditionally would have done it because obviously it's a little bit different now. But a lot of the research was done, it, it, when I write, I, I sort of, do a bunch of research and then I go away and write and then I hit something that I need to know more about so I make a note and then I go back and research that thing so when I started to write this book I read very indiscriminately I read all around Victorian London and then as I knew more about the story I could hone the research in and tighten it and say right that's what I need to know more about and I've spoke to some really, um, there's, I think I mentioned this last time, but there are really fantastic volunteers in, in organisations and museums who can help you as well. And the Transport for London uh, volunteers are, are phenomenal because they just helped me get Ava around 1858 London. So it doesn't matter on one level if it's accurate or not, but for me it does. Yeah. So the historical side of this is, is really as accurate as I could make it. And even the journeys that she makes to the docks and, um, you know, the way she does that is, is absolutely historically accurate, which, which nobody is going to care about except me and the <laughs> volunteer at London Transport Museum. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that's the way I did it. I would go and I had quite, I'd absorbed a lot of information about the, the weather, the flavour of Victorian London. I've also got a friend who is an expert who, who read it through for me as well in Victorian London and I was very lucky with her and she, she gave me some good tips. So generally, big picture, I had done all the, a lot of the research already, but then when I got to the book, book two, there were some sections I needed to go back and ask questions about and find out more about. So it was sort of an ongoing process. Yeah, I see. Mm. One of the things that really struck me with reading this, um, in particular, probably in comparison to the first book, was a really strong sense of female energy and female power and I found that mm -hmm. really interesting you know they talk about the family and they're bleeding together and they're very matter of fact about and when they're bleeding when they have their periods this is their time when of strength for them um, and I thought that mm -hmm. was a really really interesting message can you tell us more about writing that into it and incorporating that in mm. 
I did it deliberately because um, Dunlin contrasts starkly with Victorian London, which has got a lot of um, prudery around bodily functions. Um, and I wanted these women to be owning every aspect of their womanhood um, and to be celebrating that. And actually it does also, you know, I've done some reading around some, some more traditional societies often do treat the menstrual cycle as a, as a time of strength. And, you know, sometimes you, you, you get the taboo around it and other times it's like, well, that's when your power is at its, you know, at its most. And so I, I deliberately did that. I just sort of took some things that I'd read, but also my own ideas of wanting these women to be uh, wanting to completely go against the taboos that are often built in around the female body and to make it part of their power, which I guess is a little um, contrary in, in some ways, because that's not at all the way that it's approached by many people in the world today. But yeah, that was a deliberate decision. I wanted, I wanted that to happen. I wanted that to be part of their power and part of something that we should embrace. And indeed, why shouldn't we? So yeah. Yeah, they're yeah. very matter of fact about it. Mm. And, mm. and I, I thought that was quite interesting too with some of the, the things about Dunlin that are superior. I mean, the, the, their use of energy as well um, is mm -hmm. referenced, I think, in, in the first book about using wind and water and that sort of thing That's right. as well, rather yes. than the coal that actually yes. is what happened back in the day. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's right well those are deliberate decisions as well because it's sort of like that's the fun about playing around with history is that you can take a different path and so it's, it's like Dunlin is obviously not London but it's taken different paths like the combustion engine was never developed there for instance and so it's what would happen if that path wasn't taken and you can play around with that in a fairly loose sort of way if you have this sort of convenient parallel world to do it in so yeah. so I did I did make some deliberate decisions about what could have been had mm. certain things not happened. Mm. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. Now, the other thing that struck me when I was reading this was it didn't remind me of reading um, that great Australian time travel classic, Playing Biddy Bo by Ruth Park. Mm. When I was reading this, mm -hmm. I was I was thinking back to my school days and studying that um, at school and whatnot. So um, I just wondered if you had a, any sort of... Um, thoughts around how schools could incorporate this into curriculum or um, themes that you were hoping that, you know, schools might pull forth from it if they mm. were to study mm. it? Yeah. Um, I think I've actually talked to some teachers already about it and they have said that things like uh, social expectations and hierarchies and what, how people um how they how they restrict people but also how people can pull out of those you know so how they can um, create their own agency within certain st uh, structures is one thing um, but they were interested in the in the compound languages of, of Malaika you know the uh, mm. angel they were interested in the sort of the, those the alternatives to um, yeah like you pointed out the uh, energy alternatives um, Expectations of gender, that was one that somebody raised, which I thought was quite interesting, which, which mm. again, refers to what you just said. So we, within, obviously, the way Dunlin approaches gender, and, and obviously um, they are much more open to certain ways of thinking about what gender is, which mm. I don't specify in any detail, but it's there in the background, and I don't know if you picked it up um, in the circus scene, like you have a, mm. a non-binary ringmaster, mm. for instance. Um, and but also with the way that uh, Ava is, you know, that her the expectations on her and how she has to sort of overcome her own conditioning to to sort of become come into herself, um, at her, her own true power. Um, so yeah, so those those identity, mm. self discovery, truth finding, um, what is true, what is you know what what is definition of truth and how do you find it and how do you define it for yourself. Um, and I suppose the first book is very much about identity and coming into yourself and finding out what it is that you are and who you are and, and setting your own boundaries as a result of that. And the second book is, is, is also that, but it builds on that with connection. I think connection is a very strong theme, the importance of connection and the importance of realising your true self, but also that you're not an island. And this is something that I feel 
quite strongly about is that often you have this lone hero who is saves the world and in, in a lot of, they're a lot of fun to read and write but but I wanted this to be a little bit different in that yes you have this girl who has certain powers and certain capabilities but she cannot realize her own true worth without pulling together with all these other people around her and and Jack also actually goes through that um, arc so yeah there's a few things it's there's there's a few layers I think that you can pull into with this book yeah absolutely so many layers I I really Mm. like that idea that that connection and again to me that um really again comes back to that feminine energy because I think that often is Mm -hmm. um the, I mean, I guess maybe historically the way that we talk about women is, is, is being in that social circle and, and that's how the power was, um, I guess, the strongest was, was that recognition of working together was, was how things yes. were accomplished and you're more powerful. Well, that's right. Others. And there's so much power in that energy and often it's not seen and it's not noticed. And yet um, often it's the person who rises to the top that gets all the accolades and the attention without any acknowledgement of the huge efforts and the quiet support and you know emotional labor and all the other types of labor that go on behind the scenes um so yeah so I just wanted to to sort of bring that out a little bit because I I, for me it's an it's an important thing and um yeah so that Ava wasn't going to get there on her own she had to she had to pull with others but but also be very much in her own power while she did so yeah Thank you so much, Karen. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you about the book. I've really, really enjoyed oh. this one. I would definitely recommend everyone pick up a copy. It's out on the 15th of July, I believe. The 19th, 19th. The 19th of July. 19th of July. Yeah, so Tuesday. 19th. And there's a book launch for people in Melbourne um, at Brunswick Bound, yeah, which is- everybody's welcome to. Thank you so much, Dana. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thanks, Karen.